Hello, my friend. Stay a while and listen. What you're about to see will be a bit of an odd video for me. I've actually, believe it or not, been working on this for years. I've gotten back into gaming, uh, follow me on Twitch, in the last couple of years specifically, but back when I barely played anything besides Hearthstone and Marvel Puzzle Quest, which is also something I might end up doing a video on, that'll be weird too, but I wanted to lay out my love for the Diablo franchise. I'd put together a rough script a while back and was actually starting to replay the early games to both capture footage and test them against my own memory. Now, I did have a note in there uh, almost from the beginning about my reservations about the developer and publisher, Activision Blizzard, you know, between predatory monetization practices, the firing of hundreds of employees the same year, the company post directive profits, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I was still moving forward. I'd finish several of my replays of the first game and was almost done with my first full replay of uh, Diablo 2 when 2021 <laughs> happened. Uh, the full scope of abuse within the company became evident and, well, I just stopped working on this. I didn't have it in me to praise even the old stuff that was associated with the company, but some time has passed since then. And while my opinions have not changed, I still haven't returned to Hearthstone and I will not play Diablo 4, despite the love of the series that I'm about to profess, I also felt annoyed that I was never going to talk about what I used to love about these games. So, uh, screw it. I used to deeply love these games, and I want to talk about why. In my younger years, I did not PC game very much. I was raised on Nintendo and the ambiguity of having to make sure that my PC had the specs to run any given game made me wary of PC gaming just as a general concept. I didn't like the idea that I couldn't just plug in any game. But there were a few that I did still get pulled into. Heroes of Might and Magic 2, Dungeon Keeper, Wizardry 8 when I got to college. But the big one was the Diablo franchise. Long before Blizzard ruined the franchise's reputation with the abysmally predatory Diablo Immortal, which, as a quick reminder, launched with a progression system that required either $110,000 of investment or 10 years of playtime to fully boost a single character. No, I'm not kidding. And now they're trying to claw that reputation back with Diablo 4. But the first three games ate a significant number of hours of my life. And I should mention at this point, this is not going to be a comprehensive look of either the history or the mechanics of the Diablo franchise. This is going to be me relaying my own personal experience with the games and talking about the bits that I think are neat and how those evolved over the first three games. I'm not a game designer. Most folks would probably consider me a borderline casual gamer at the best of times. And just to make the point one final time, do not take this video or anything I'm saying in relation to these games as praise for the company that owns and produces the franchise. I will say it at least one more time, F Activision Blizzard. So, uh, with that out of the way, let's actually have some fun. I can probably thank my enjoyment of Warcraft 2 for getting me into Diablo in the first place. If I'm remembering correctly, the expansion disc Beyond the Dark Portal, which I never did beat all the way through, included a demo for the then upcoming first Diablo game. You, you remember demos when actual finished sections of gameplay were just given away for free to show you how good this finished product you could buy was going to be instead of things like closed betas where you have to basically win the lottery for the privilege of playing an unfinished game? Yeah, I'm old. Anyways, it was effectively the first segment of the game up through the battle with the Butcher around the third level down into the church. <sighs> Fresh meat. I was hooked pretty much immediately. As mentioned, I was not the most plugged in gamer even at the time, so I can't really give you much of an assessment of how big a splash the game made on the gaming scene as a whole. I mean, I know it sold well, but finding out more specifics would be a research thing, and uh, it's, it's not me. I'm here to have a nice stroll down memory lane today, if it's all the same to you. So speaking only for myself, the first Diablo was something of a revelation. 
I'd gotten into RPGs on the Super Nintendo, but those were nearly all turn-based, colorful, and absolutely nothing like this. This was dark, action-focused, highly replayable thanks to the randomized elements. I would actually argue that the first game is the most replayable game of the series with the random factors and the way that they are implemented, which is quite intelligently. In later games, uh, there were a lot more fixed areas and the quest progression went the same on every playthrough. Really, all that was randomized by the time we got to Diablo 3 was the loot and the shape of most of the dungeons. So overall, the follow-ups felt more linear and rigid with each entry, with the only major variance being the kind of character you build to get through it all, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but we'll get to all that. In the original game, you wouldn't always get the same quests each time. They'd come at you in clusters. So, for instance, in the first few floors of the church, there is a cluster of two and a cluster of three. So you'd either get the Poisoned Well or the Skeleton King, and then you'd get two out of three from a cluster that consisted of the Butcher, Ogden Sign, and Garbad the Weak. Odds were you'd get at least a slightly different mix each playthrough, with the random elements still being controlled enough that, you know, you were almost guaranteed to see all the quests at some point if you played through one time with each of the three character types. Like I say, it's well balanced for the size of that first game. Three character classes pretty much ensures that you'll see all the content if you go through with each one. If there had been more character classes, that would have exceeded the variation granted on the replays. If there'd been a fourth class to play through, you'd have nothing new to discover in terms of the quests. Randomness in general is much more baked into that first game, and it ran through a ton of its elements, affecting almost everything from encounters to quests to loot, naturally, to level progression. Since that first game, the randomness has been dialed back with each new entry to the point of becoming, honestly, a little bit token. Keeping the loot somewhat randomized makes sense as ultimately Diablo is a loot-heavy series, and maybe even the dungeon interiors to at least keep you from memorizing the layouts, but I don't know. Why are the open areas of the second and third games laid out randomly so you're stuck walking the outer perimeter with the minimap up the whole time just to figure out what the heck is even there? I mean, in Diablo 3, most of the really significant areas have fixed layouts rather than random ones, which just serves to highlight how unnecessary and vestigial the entire idea of the randomness has become at this point. It just feels like it's there because of tradition. I suspect the only reason they don't pack it in altogether with the procedural maps is fear of fan backlash. But it would honestly make more sense as a design element at this point to just drop it. Well, they may have in the fourth game. I don't know. I won't play it. But by the third game, even, it would have made more sense to get rid of it. But coming back to that first game and the randomness, there was an interesting wrinkle in that the three playable classes weren't all that rigidly defined. I mean, granted, they did play differently. They had certain things each was better at than the others. The rogue moved faster in general and could fire arrows more quickly than anyone else could. The warriors swung faster with melee weapons and plus had the strength to wear the heaviest armor and carry the most damaging melee weapons. And the sorcerer had the biggest mana pool and did the most damage with spells. There were also stat caps for each class that would keep you from boosting a sorcerer's strength stat so high that he could wear scale mail or boosting the warrior's intelligence to the point of being able to cast big high-end room clearing spells. But until the latter parts of the game where you got to the high-end gear and the high-end spells that needed the truly top tier stats, there was nothing stopping you from equipping a sorcerer with a bow or having your warrior cast spells as long as you met the stat requirement. In that first game, gear wasn't class specific just stat restricted. That very first time, I started with a warrior because he was the easiest to get a hang of. But the rogue was my first completed playthrough. I loved her long range specialty, and while she couldn't rival the sorcerer for spell damage, she could get her magic stat high enough to cast some pretty decent spells. The sorcerer was by far the most challenging because in that first game, Learning spells required finding spell books, which were random drops, like all the other loot. You could also buy spell books in town from the witch, but that was A, 
really expensive, and also got randomly reshuffled each time you came back to town. In other words, it was theoretically possible to be trying for a sorcerer run and just never come across the books for the spells you really wanted. Or more realistically, not finding as many as you want because that's how you level up the spells is by finding more books of the same spell. So if you had a favorite spell, there was no guarantee you'd get it at an opportune point in the game. And also no guarantee that you would be able to level it up to stay effective as you went deeper and deeper into the dungeon. This did sometimes make the sorcerer a pain to play. But let me tell you, if you did get the good stuff, you felt like a walking nuclear strike. And it was pretty awesome. Now, honestly, the atmosphere of the game was the thing that really blew me away at the time. The moody music, the dark graphics, the sense that something was about to jump out from around the corner at any moment. Oh my gosh, woe befall any adventurer who went through a doorway into a room full of gargoyles without realizing it. Or there were also those things called the hidden, which were flat out invisible until they popped into existence to attack you. The story, well, the story is honestly pretty basic, but if you're like me and replayed this over and over and over again to see how much better you could get your character on this run, then you spend so much time just in the environment. You get immersed in the world without needing a particularly deep narrative to do it. Now, each of those first three games in the series has always had multiplayer. And I'll admit, I didn't really bother with it all that much, especially not in that first game. I mean, I was on dial-up internet in rural Vermont for crying out loud. So the first one was, for me at least, strictly a single-player experience. But it was one I kept coming back to over and over again. Each time somehow feeling new, even though I'd been through the whole thing multiple times, I would still take the time to talk to Farnham or come up with snarky comebacks for Wurt's BS. And yes, I would indeed. Stay a while and listen. The first game takes place in nothing but a single town built over a seemingly bottomless pit of baddies. Every five floors or so, there's a shift in scenery as you go from relatively well-maintained rooms to aging stone passageways to caves and eventually the very depths of hell. The sound design and the music were especially good at drawing me in. Diablo as a series, but that first game in particular has one of the all-time great unsettling ambient soundtracks. There's groans that you'll hear, and you can't be sure if it's part of the musical score or if a zombie is about to eat the back of your head. There are times you hear a baby's cry off in the distance, and that's part of the actual music. And I don't know how composer Matt Yeoman managed to make something as familiar as an electric guitar sound so otherworldly in some of those deeper areas, but it sends a shudder up my spine to this day. The voice work, well, it's good for the time. Find the Admiral for me, and I'll get to work. A Blizzard had access to decent voice actors, uh, and they'd really knocked it out of the park when it came to Warcraft 2, but that also had a lighter tone. Hello, yes, me lord, okay. yes, me lord. Diablo's more serious feel meant the slightly exaggerated voices of some of the characters, uh, they don't fully gel. <laughs> No hurt, no kill. Keep alive, and next time, good bring to you. But nothing's so off that it breaks the spell that the game casts over me as a player. Well, besides some of the sorcerer's pompous line readings... It is hot down here. I suspect you may have noticed that I have talked about the atmosphere, the feel, quite a bit. Uh, not so much about the plot, because... 
there really wasn't much of one, and what is there can be ignored if the player doesn't feel like figuring out the why behind all this. There are details you can't help but pick up. Monsters coming out of hole, go down hole, kill monsters. That's enough motivation for most players, and if you feel like skipping through dialogue, you don't have to engage with the story at all, really. But if you want to, there's plenty going on with character backstories and world buildings sprinkled across the game for whoever's here for that. Glory and approbation to Diablo, Lord of Terror and leader of the three. It's one of those games where a ton of work and planning went into the setting and very little went into the plot. And for other games, that might sound like a criticism, but the original Diablo, it seemed to be aware of the fact nobody was really here for the plot. It's kind of like if you've ever played Doom 2016. You remember how that approached its story? If you wanted the story, it's around. You can pick up on it if you feel like it, but you're here to kill monsters in space in Doom and in Diablo in a dark fantasy setting and to get better gear for doing so. So it's worth saying that while there isn't much of a narrative, there is a ton of lore. If you really want to dig into that end of things, I tended to be happy with the bits I picked up over the course of the game and honestly letting my imagination fill in the rest, not being that much of a lore hound myself. Though, despite not being all that big into lore, I did rather enjoy the monsters. And boy, what a lineup that was. There were skeletons, zombies, skeletons with bows and arrows, gargoyles, demons, some of which I will probably have to censor or not show you at all. And then later installments gave us uh, cat people and uh, porcupines, uh, big bugs, bats. And, uh, okay, uh, you know what? Uh, it's not exactly the most original creature lineup in the world, if I'm being completely honest. I suspect they were largely selected for being the best fit for the atmosphere and just being darker versions of fairly standard fantasy stuff with the more whimsical things such as fairies or unicorns or honestly even dragons just being thrown out and not used. But for the darker side of fantasy, it's got you pretty well covered. I mean, we've got things like the Fallen Ones, which are basically goblin equivalents, and they speak in this jabbering language, and they get resurrected by uh, a shaman. Okay, that that, feel, that feels a little off. I think it's an accident, I'm sure. I mean, that, that kind of monster's been around since the very first one. They're sort of traditional. Uh, later on, the second one, the jungle area, there's the... Uh, uh, the, f the fetishes. <laughs> Oh, oh dear. Okay, so maybe we best move on from the monster concepts at this point. Uh, and I mean, given the isometric view, it's not exactly a showpiece for the graphics or the creatures anyway. Now, uh, I never played the expansion Hellfire, but it's just as well. It was a third party project, would later be declared non canon anyway. So when I was in college, there was Diablo 2. I don't know how many hours of sleep. I lost to this one and its expansion. The base game had five classes with unique skill trees and abilities and select gear that only their class could use. So you couldn't really multi-class like you could before, but it meant that even within each class were significantly different play styles because each class had three disciplines to gain new abilities in and craft a precise play style for how you wanted to approach things. This meant that even within a class, you could craft a different build on each playthrough. In the initial game, three of the five classes were analogous to the ones from the original. The Paladin played similar to the Warrior, the Amazon played similar to the Rogue, or at least she did if you specialized in bows, and the Sorceress was naturally similar to the Sorcerer. For the newbies, we had the Barbarian, which was a powerhouse with a less controlled style than the Paladin, wading in and just berserking his way through enemies. And then there was the Necromancer, whose skill set was best for creating his own personal army of undead minions to slow down the enemy hordes while he stayed back and picked off whoever his forces couldn't take down on their own, and then blew up the corpses. Because that, <laughs> that was always fun. There were a ton of new features added as well, such as armor sets, where each unique piece becomes more powerful the more matching parts of that set you have, class-specific equipment, the ability to supplement your equipment with gems and runes, even hire an NPC support character who you can also equip with better gear. Diablo 2 also built out the world significantly, partly for the obvious reason that it's not taking place in a single town. There were four acts, each with a new setting, with a different fundamental feel and new baddies to take on. You start out in a rogue encampment, and the first act is 
honestly very similar to the original game on pretty much every level. From the monsters you encounter to the general aesthetic and the music, the soundscape of it, to the fact that it ends with you descending into a cathedral. But then you move on to the desert, where you're dealing with a much more lively city, brightly lit environments, a shift in musical tone and more wide open areas. Then you've got the jungle for act three and the, yep, yeah, no, we're not gonna talk about them. And you finish up in hell for act four. None of these are super original settings on their own. I mean, it's basically grassland deserts, jungle and lava levels from Mario with a dark fantasy makeover, but it gave you a much better picture of the larger world the first game really only hinted at. There's also a lot more plot going on, though you as the player kind of have an odd role in it. So the backstory of the first game was that there are three prime evils of which Diablo is only one, and they're trapped in things called soul stones on the earthly plane. And they can still exert influence. Diablo's soul stone was damaged, so it's not enough on its own to contain him. Now the first game ended with the player character shoving the soul stone into their own head in an attempt to keep the demon at bay within themselves. Now, canonically, it's the warrior who does this, but there is also a rogue and a sorcerer who were present and there, as far as the canon is concerned. The second game firmly cements the running threat of the game series being the corrupting power of evil, and all three of the first game's heroes were tainted by their fight with Diablo. The rogue and sorcerer appear as boss fights in the first and second acts of Diablo 2, respectively, and the warrior is now referred to as the Dark Wanderer. So he's going through the world, working towards freeing Mephisto and Baal, the other two prime evils, and horrible things basically follow him wherever he goes. What you as the player are doing is following the Dark Wanderer's trail and trying to undo what's been done to the areas where the Wanderer has been. So basically, you're the janitor. And if some folks don't like this and feel like it's annoying to not ever feel like the main character, I don't really have a counter argument to that, but speaking personally, I really dug this. I've said many times, I love the idea of playing out smaller stories in a bigger world. So I kind of like that you're playing as someone who is unlikely to be remembered when all this is over. The things you do matter, but you, you're nobody. You're not a figure of legend, you're the poor schmuck who has to deal with what happens when figures of legends trapes through and wreck everything. The Diablo 2 expansion, dubbed Lord of Destruction, added on a fifth act, which may be my single favorite setting in any of the games. You're up in the snowy north where the barbarians live and you start at a fort and it's under siege. So the first thing you do is go out the gates into a literal army of enemies. You'd run into hordes in the games before this, but having them assembled for a purpose rather than just being something you stumbled across really gave this a whole new feel. The expansion also brought the usual new loot and such, but it brought not one, but two new character classes. The assassin, who can be built to get in close and take enemies apart with martial arts, bit of a glass cannon kind of build, or set deadly traps for the enemies to set off, or both. And the druid, who had some magic, some summoning stuff, a little similar to the necromancer, uh, and also the ability to actually transform to either a werewolf or a werebear and completely change the nature of combat by basically becoming either a speed demon or a power tank on the fly. Story-wise, the expansion also pretty well wrapped up the narrative. By the end of Lord of Destruction, all three of the prime evils, plus two out of four of the lesser evils, have been defeated. Though it does end with the destruction of the World Stone, which is said will alter the course of the world going forward, and that might sound like a sequel hook, but whereas the original game and the Diablo II base game both left things with flagrantly unfinished stories, this is a point where you could actually stop and feel like it's just an uncertain future, which is an ending style that usually works for me. That's probably part of why Blizzard got away with taking more than a decade to release Diablo 3. Now, Diablo 3 took me a little time to warm up to, if I'm gonna be totally honest. I did like it. It brought back all those warm dungeon crawly feelings, but most of the settings felt like visually upgrading versions of old ones. None of it felt as new as what Diablo 2 added. And some of the changes and new features 
they took me a little bit of time to come around on. One of those was the original way that the loop drops were handled. So you may not be aware of this, but these were originally clearly designed to facilitate the real money economy and auction house where players would pay real cash money to bid on gear they wanted. So to encourage trading and sales, those initial loot drops were pretty much completely random and the odds of you getting a bit of gear for your specific class, much less one you wanted, weren't great. This was rightfully derided by critics and fans alike, and in less than a year from launch, it was confirmed that this would be removed from the game. And I never went in for this thing. But once the auction house was gone, the loot drops were rebalanced excellently. So you primarily got stuff for the class you were playing, and I found the progression of gear and the rarity to be really well handled once the malarkey with the auction house was gone. So that initial problem became all kinds of moot. But uh, it would have been a pretty big omission for me to not mention it, especially since it was an early indicator of the kind of bull that Activision Blizzard would start pulling in, in later years in regards to monetization. But anyways, Diablo 3 came with five character classes, two holdovers, three new ones. The Barbarian from Diablo 2 was just ported straight in, and the Sorceress was rebranded as a wizard. Well, it was effectively the same class. For newcomers, there was the Monk, which played a little bit like a melee-focused assassin. There was the Demon Hunter, which was like a mashup of a trap assassin and a bow Amazon. And the Witch Doctor, which brought together elements of the Necromancer and the Druid. This was the first game in the series to not have genders pre-assigned to each class. In the first game, the Warrior and Sorcerer were always male, and the Rogue was always a woman. Diablo II with expansion, had barbarians, necromancers, paladins, and druids for sir, and sorceresses, amazons, and assassins for the ladies. Diablo 3 allowed any class to be played by any gender, which sounds like a minor touch, but was something I actually appreciated quite a bit for what should be fairly obvious reasons, especially this was around the time I was really starting to question my own sense of gender. This sort of tweak kind of describes actually many of the improvements the franchise made over the year. Small changes that you might not have thought to ask for, but they were great once you had them. Diablo is actually one of those series where it can be pretty hard to go back and play the earlier entries if you don't have nostalgia goggles to put on, because you're suddenly missing a ton of tweaks to the play, the progression, quality of life improvements that were added later on that it's just hard to imagine the game without. For instance, after you play Diablo 2 and get to plan your character build and how you intend to spend your skill points, it is kind of hard to go back to Diablo 1 and be at the mercy of the random number generator in order to be able to acquire spells at all. But speaking personally, at least, I probably wouldn't have complained about that element of Diablo 1 at the time only after I got to play the refined alternative. Which brings us to the main aspect of Diablo 3 that took a bit of time for me to warm to, and that's the new skill system and the leveling. Well, actually, there's also the visuals. It doesn't feel as moody to me this time. It's really hard for me to pinpoint why that is, so I didn't want to dwell on it. Probably something to do with the lighting systems. Uh, but anyway, the way Diablo 2's level progression worked was that once you spent a skill point, it was gone. It's part of what prompted me to replay Diablo 2 as many times as I did, realizing that I could have allocated my skill points better than I did and going back all the way to the start to do it properly, or just wanting to try out a completely different build for kicks. And back when I was in college and had the stamina of a 20-something, I really dug that. With Diablo 3, you can actually reallocate your skills at any time. New tiers of skill open up as you go, and you can take points away from one skill and drop them into another, or even change what ones you're using at any point. Well, at sort of, not quite at any point. Uh, when it was initially released, it was an always online game, so you couldn't pause and switch things up mid combat. And even now, um, you aren't allowed to change it while you are engaged with enemies, so there has to at least be a lull in the combat. But if you're feeling experimental, you can get out of the area you're in and rework your build. The ranged combat demon hunter not quite working? Switch it around, try a melee-focused variety. 
Initially, this actually annoyed me for what I now recognize as a uh, pretty immature and stupidly gatekeepy reason. Because at first I thought it made things too easy. I thought about how many hours I had to sink into Diablo 2 to make my best characters and that I had to do it each time I even had a new idea for a build. But now any old putz can just switch over to a completely different character build without earning it. What? Yeah, yeah, for a few months I, uh, I was that guy. I did still think I was a guy at the time, so it's okay to put it that way. Uh, I ain't proud of it, thankfully. I did keep those thoughts to myself. I didn't post them anywhere. Uh, they were still there though. But I came to love that aspect, even at the time, because I was 30 when Diablo 3 came out. I was working a job, I had a kid, and I frankly did not have the time to restart the game every single time I wanted to do a new build. I still don't have the time to do that, even now that whatever this thing is you're watching is actually my job and I work from home. I don't have to start over anymore. Yeah, I've realized I've become the gamer who needs the easier way to do things. And my ability to do that doesn't actually affect the experience of my 20 year old self who is prepared to play until 2 a.m., which bless them, I'm not. This is also the game in which the player character has the most agency within the story. Instead of playing just another human, you're now a Nephilim, basically the descendant of demons and angels without truly being either. So you're more significant this time. Your actions actually drive the plot. There's still plenty going on beyond your scope, but you're regarded as more of a threat by the forces of hell than you ever were in the first two games. And that's another thing that took me a little bit of time to get used to, but by this point, it also makes sense to escalate the player's importance. The story also ties up the loose ends of the two remaining lesser evils who had yet to be seen actually in the games up to that point. So it tackled Asmodan and Belial. There's also some aspects of the plot I just, I, I frankly don't love. Like, there's a rather grim fate for a character I'd gotten quite invested in, which just felt cosmically unfair. Then again, it's certainly in keeping with the tone of the series, so I, I can't say it's a bad fit or anything like that, just that it was the kind of grim that rubbed me the wrong way for some reason. I, I don't know, it's just like a step too far. Another thing about Diablo 3, is this the point where the story at least seemed to be running out of steam? Diablo 2 had it easy, cause all it had to do was expand the world beyond the one town, but there isn't actually all that much which the third one was able to add world-wise. As I noted, most locations are heavily reminiscent of previous ones, really with only the high heavens being anything truly new. As for the plot, the final two lesser evils are dealt with, Diablo himself manages to come back again, spoiler alert, get another SmackDown, which honestly feels a bit tacked on, which might also be part of the reason I don't like the fate of that character because it's tied to that. Anyway, like his return in the second game felt inevitable with the way the first one ended, but this time it feels way more like the story contorting itself to fit him in because his name is literally the name of the game. It's not a total face plant, but after this, there wasn't really anywhere for the thing to go at this point that wouldn't feel like a retread of some form and one could argue the story was already starting to feel that way after Lord of Destruction. That doesn't mean that uh, Blizzard stopped, of course. Enter the Reaper of Souls expansion, which does indeed feel like a rather needless addition, at least as far as the story aspect is concerned. All the evils of hell have been dealt with, so now we have a corrupted angel instead, which is functionally not all that much different. It's... Still a decent expansion. It added in the Crusader class, uh, which plays a bit like the Paladin from the second game, but it can't help but feel anemic, especially when compared to Lord of Destruction. It felt like little more than an after dinner mint. There's also a Rise of the Necromancer DLC, but all that did was bring in the Necromancer class. It didn't expand the story or the world in any way, so I actually didn't even bother with that one. Now, there's more to the series than just the games. There's novels, comics. Some characters appeared in uh, Blizzard's Heroes of the Storm back when that was still trying to be a thing. I never really got into those. With the current state of Activision Blizzard, it's a guarantee I will not be trying out any of the newer games anytime soon. Probably not at all. Diablo Immortal is 
just insulting. And while Diablo 4 is getting strong reviews at the time of this recording, it's not enough to get me to support the company as it currently exists. And no, I'm not going to shame or wag a finger at anyone who is deciding to play it or any other Activiz product. If you're playing it, enjoying it, that's great. For me, I just, I, I, I can't. That's a me thing. Making that decision a little bit easier, though, is that some of the details about the release have come forward. It, it, it really makes Diablo 4 look like a retread more than anything else. It launched with five character classes, and not a single one of them is new. We've got the Barbarian, Sorcerer, Druid, Rogue, and Necromancer. One or two legacy classes is one thing. Clearly, the Necromancer was popular enough to justify an entire DLC in Diablo 3's, but not even a single new concept. Really? I don't know. It's clearly not scaring people off the game. It made a shockingly appropriate amount of money pulling in $666 million in its five-day launch window. And good for them, I guess, but I'd rather boot up the older games and relive those experiences. Yes, I am old. Thank you for noticing. But the grim reality is I don't have much hope for the future of this franchise, at least not for what I used to love about it. But I will always have those first three games. And for me, it was one hell of a ride. Are you a fan of Diablo? What do you think about it? Do you like it for the reasons I do? Do you like it for other reasons? Are you playing and enjoying Diablo 4? Whatever your thoughts may be, I'd love to hear them. Drop them down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills. Enables me to do this as my living. There's links to other things I do in the description. Don't worry all that much about it, though. Because what I really want you to remember is you are beautiful, you are valid, and you are loved. You are the council, I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. And now my thanks to my Patreon supporters that make this possible, including Robin Moore, Zubin Lipfula, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Ruth, Oliver B, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Melinda Walters, Jen, T. Love, Auntie Kate 808, Renabi Likes the Poodle, Robin Powell, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casper, Adam RDL Taylor, Dave Hall, Shayla Gourlay, and Rosalind Bennett. You can get uh, my. The, bah, I get all the names right and then I can't talk. If you want to hear me stumble over my tongue after saying your name, it's in the rewards here on the Patreon. Bleh.